Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back from lunch. Hopefully, everyone's making it. Uh, we're almost, what, halfway through day two here <laughs> at Atmosphere. Um, my name is Stace Bale. I am a director of engineering at eHarmony.com, um, a big dating website, if you haven't heard of the brand. Um, my areas of responsibility there, I, I lead all of our user-facing development teams, and that includes um, native uh, mobile application development. I also led uh, the engineering effort in, in choosing our APM solution and rolling that out. So um, you know, that's what brings me here today. Um, I'm going to tell a little bit of our story uh, in two parts, you know, where, where we were as an organization that, that led us down the path of, of needing this solution. Um, how we chose it, and quickly in, in terms of you know, the order of which and how we rolled it out, and then get in a little bit to you know, once it was in place, um, you know how, how it really changed uh, our engineering department and in, had a surprising cultural shift that that was very natural for us. Um, you know, once we had this, so um, we're Los Angeles based. Uh, I spend probably too much time in the car, so I got to use a little bit of a driving metaphor through the presentation. So. I was like, you look at this guy, he's, he's not too happy, but he's, he's, he's moving along. Um, that sort of sums up maybe a bit of the attitude <laughs> with some problems we were having two years ago when we were down, going down this path. Um, you know, eHarmony is, uh, we started in the early 2000s, so it's, it's a mature brand, um, you know, built very much as a, a web 1.0 application. So, you know, we were in the process of, you know, like many companies, breaking apart a giant Java-based monolithic um, application connecting to just a huge Oracle rack install. You know, in, in building out an SOA architecture, uh, we were well underway with that, uh, and you know, with mobile coming on board, increasing just a huge user demand. Um, you know, we are a global company, so we had traffic around the world. And that was that was really putting structure or stress on some of our legacy applications. We are going through a period of uh, real instability, um, you know, as well as, as changing architecture and moving into some new microservices at the time. So at that point in time, we were, we were really reactive um, and not proactive to, pr to production issues. You know, we, were the, you know, we knew something went down when synthetic monitoring, you know, or users called and, and said, hey, the site's not available. Um, as our architecture was changing and we were building new services, you know, teams really had very little visibility into you know, how what they were doing interacted both with the, with the legacy application or how the service tiers were interacting with each other. Um, and we really had very little visibility into you know, our users' customer experience. So you know, those are the problems. Um, you know, having some outages, not able to diagnose them. So driving again, the team, team often felt like we were just going off a cliff. Um, I think as you've heard through lots of presentations this week, you know, we, we were definitely in a dilemma where we had too many tools in the tool chest. Again, both from the age of our infrastructure and you know, it was very much a climate of you know, fragmentation of systems. Uh, every year that I was, since, since I started until we adopted APM, you know, someone from ops would come up with what was gonna be the new greatest monitoring solution to rule them all, and they'd work on it for a year, and then the next year there'd be something else. So we, we had too many sources of truth, didn't really know where to find data. They were all very compartmentalized views, um, so we couldn't put things together. It ended up having lots of holes through maintenance problems, too. You know, we were pretty good when we rolled a service out or rolled something out new. We'd have monitoring in the beginning, but because engineering didn't own the solutions, it tended not to get maintained over time, so we'd have, you know, the service would evolve over time, we'd be missing data, or we'd have a lot of data that was no longer pertinent to, to the states that things were. This made the teams become very siloed, because no one had a big picture, we couldn't really tell what you were working on, how it interacted with, with what another team might be doing. Um, too many solutions led to too much noise. We had ineffective uh, alerting, so it was either we wouldn't get the right alert, or a single point of failure would go, and you'd get a thousand emails in, and you couldn't tell what was going on. Um, you know, and we had user-facing outages, which, again, just you know, because we couldn't tell what was happening and the site was going down, um, everyone in the room just, just running around, and it would take, you know, sometimes hours to really be able to diagnose what the problem was and get a fix out. Um, we're a subscription-based company uh, and a large, you know, consumer brand, so outage, outages for us are, 
are kind of awful <laughs> in tech. You've got half the business spending money on you know, commercials and media acquisition, and they're screaming because users can't sign up and they can't buy. And then we've got a paid subscriber base who has a very high expectation of availability. So if we go down, you know, they're wanting their money back or, or they're yelling at you too. So um, stability you know, was one of the main issues and things we needed to address right away um, and be able to make, you know, improve the problems we were having, plus with our changing architecture, um, ensure that we had continual uptime. When we looked into APM, and you know, spoiler alert, we, we did choose AppDynamics. Um, time to market was one of my, my biggest parameters. You know, we were having user-facing issues. We were in the, in the midst of an architecture change. Um, I, I didn't have a year to, to try and build something in-house or, or to, to roll something out. Um, I needed to do with minimal resources. Again, that had been an ongoing problem for us. As we, you know, no one was really dedicated to owning monitoring, you know, which is how it became so fragmented. So I needed to be able to do this with a small team and do it quickly. Um, we were wanting to shift. Uh, our data center operations team had usually owned all of our monitoring solutions before. You know, this was an engineering pain point. Stability was, was our problem. I wanted us to be able to roll it out and then socialize it through the company. Um, Baselines and the ability to do more effective alerting. This was one of the key things with AppDynamics that I think for us um, really set it apart from some of the other solutions we were looking at. You know, again, being a user-facing and consumer-facing site, our traffic patterns vary wild, wildly. You know, one in the afternoon is dramatically different than you know, six or seven at night. A Tuesday is very different than a Sunday. Um, so we needed to be able to you know, track that usage and understand what the norms are you know, at any given hour of any given day. Uh, and again, the single pane of glass, you know, done with having multiple solutions and I needed one place that I could go tie everything together. So once we picked it, um, decided with AppDynamics, this is sort of the order that we approached it, and, and if any of you guys are looking to roll out a solution, this, this is the, the direction that, that I would go. I sort of skimmed here on a D. So we've got deploy, define, diagnose, notify, and then enable discovery for your teams. So putting that in app dynamics terms, um, you've got tiers, everything's divided into tiers and nodes. So tiers are your server clusters or service layers, nodes and individual servers between that. That's gonna, those are your app agents, and they're gonna collect data. Then you've got to define business transactions, which is the beauty <laughs> of AppDynamics. That's going to divide your data up into usable chunks. Um, it's real important then, I feel, to layer on dashboards because that becomes your primary diagnostic tool to decide you know, if anything's going wrong or predict if something's going wrong. That's going to pinpoint where you go next. Layer in health rules so you get good notifications. And then transaction snapshots, I'll touch on all these things. Um, that's, that's your discovery tool. That's where you can really dig in if you've got stability problems. So this is kind of our, our simplified um, rollout. Once you've chosen AppDynamics, you know you're going to do it. Um, you create applications. Uh, you'll hear me say a couple times, start simple with the deployment. We basically created two applications at the beginning. We had prod and non-prod. Um, you'll want to define, you want to organize all of your services in, into tiers. Um, you know, and, and name those and decide how they're going to interplay. For us, it was pretty easy. Our services are, are very well defined and, and, and pretty concise. Um, once, you, once you have a general idea of how you want to organize the system, you know, we, were, we just went and deployed. And the way AppDynamics works and it starts collecting business trends or starts collecting data and how it correlates between the tiers, if you're going to roll this out, it's real important to start with your most front-facing services. So you want to start with everything that's user-facing, where all your incoming traffic is, and then layer the agents um, you know, through your tiers on down to your storage layer. So start front to back. We use Chef, so for, it was uh, pretty easy to integrate this into our normal deployment strategy. Um, really as simple as we just had to define a few variables, decide how we're naming tiers, how we're naming individual nodes. We pushed it out. Um, and, and again, I was in kind of a hurry and decided really to trust the AppDynamics do no harm <laughs> development philosophy. And it was as easy as we, I just pushed it up to a staging environment, let it run through whatever tie cycle was happening, um, waited a couple days, and then began to roll it right out to a production environment. And we did a rolling deploy. So I would put it on one or two servers um, per tier, you know, watch it for a day or two, make sure nothing was going wrong, uh, and push it out. And, 
in any way, in, in our situation, it went amazingly fast. Uh, again, having watched multiple solutions take years to roll out and never really be effective in the long run, um, you know, we went from you know, purchasing our licenses to having pretty usable data um, within a couple weeks. So it, it was great uh, in that thing. As a matter of fact, after we purchased the license, by the time they scheduled an architect to come out and work on our rollout plan, we basically had everything deployed. <laughs> um, this is an example of, of what things began to look like once we had some agents in place. So um, I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but you know, this, this is just one part of our, our user-facing environment. We've got a bunch of Node.js microservices, a big part of the legacy application that we're decommissioning in the middle, a bunch of Java tiers, um, all kinds of stores. Oracle Racks there, you know, we're using now Redis. We're a big Voldemort shop for a while. Um, we've got a bunch of HBase and you know, Spark and, and things going on. So we have a relatively complicated infrastructure. And, and this was our first picture, actually the first time we were really able to see how things were interplaying together. But once you've rolled out your agents, you, know, you start to get an idea of what's happening. But at this point, you know, the system's really just, just a bunch of traffic. The, all you've got now is you know, arrows moving everywhere, and you can't really differentiate what's happening yet. Um, this is our picture today. We ended up with, now we have four applications. Um, and you can, it wasn't the case when we rolled out, but now you can actually tie your applications together. So we separated our user-facing front services from our event-based data processing jobs. Um, our shop, we have a, a lot of batch and offline jobs. That's how we, we do the matching and, and computational processes that put our users together, our, our continuing running and, and cycles. Um, and we have another app that's just kind of our, our staging mess. So we're up to about 40 tiers, and we also, end of this year, recently layered in EUM um, for web and mobile, and I'll get into that in a second. So from the call graph, you see you know, we've, we've got all of our traffic, but you can't really tell what's happening yet. You know, everything's zooming around, but, but you don't know where it's going. Um, and that's where the business transaction comes in. So this is probably the time when you're rolling out App Dynamics, or the place you'll spend the most time. Um, it's really worth it. So the business transaction is what's gonna give you visibility into what's most important for your organization. Um, you know, for, again, for us being a dating site, things we really wanna do, you just gotta sign up. Uh, for our product, they have to complete a questionnaire. The dating site, you want users to be able to see each other, right? They got to talk to each other, and we love it when they buy. So you know, we really started that simple. Um, App Dynamics is a bunch of tools that allow you to automatically capture snapshots um, in, in business transactions from the beginning, and that's, that's useful to start, but you really, I would recommend everyone really you know, shape that down and, just, and start simple, do your key metrics, and then add more granularity over time. Um, again, this, this takes some planning, and it's a continual upkeep as your, as your services evolve, um, but it's really worth it to keep your business transactions you know, concise and, and well-defined so they're meaningful to you. Um, I'm gonna do, here's an example of um, one of the things I was talking about. So we have this concept of microtransactions, uh, especially with mobile, so you can, you can buy incremental things on the fly. Um, what's important to me is to know that all the microtrans our microtransactions healthy. Our users are able to do this. There's a lot of things involved in doing micro microtransactions. You know. um, but what I care about most is, is that system healthy? So I can define one business transaction that BT might have several different API endpoints associated with it, um, but it rolls up nicely. So then I still get the granularity when I want it, but I have concise reporting and trending over an entire service area that's important to the business. Then, you know, if I see a spike in response time or we get notifications that errors or something are happening here, then you can drill down and I can see, you know, which part of that is going wrong, but it's nice to have it always continually roll up. Um, this is an example of uh, once you define a business transaction, it also takes that nice slice out of, you know, the whole messy infrastructure in the previous slide. So now here I can see, you know, what's pertinent and what, what layers get interacted with you know, for these microtransactions to happen. And I can see health at a glance there too. So again, we've got one transaction and then only the correlated tiers you know, as that transaction moves through or as that call moves through our infrastructure. Um, so again, the VT becomes this, once you've got these defined, um, it becomes a foundation for 
all of the diagnostic tools and basically how you use app dynamics moving forward. So it, again, it's got the correlation. So as, as a call moves through your entire infrastructure, it ties that together for you. Um, you can do trends in the dynamic baselines uh, happen automatically for, for business transactions. So that's probably where you'll end up writing most of your health rules um, against, against these things that you define. Um, and when you get into a problem or you need to drill down a discovery, it's the business transaction that you'll do to actually get in. You can see a user's call and drill right down to the, the code level. Um, so moving on, we've gone from the messy traffic pattern. I've defined a bunch of business transactions. Now I can see where everything's coming and going. Um, it's going to be smooth sailing. So the drill down, I'm going to touch on this for a second and then back up because um, we're on BTs. Once you've got a business transaction, AppDynamics will automatically capture snapshots for you. So you get a bunch of real user calls coming in um, at a regular interval. So you'll, so you'll see a bunch of normal traffic. And then it's going to capture any outliers. So if you've got errors or um, response times that are outside of the norm, you get a sampling of those too. So in the transaction snapshot, this is going to be your single pane view across tiers. So you can see an actual incoming call, and you can, you can progress all the way through your infrastructure to see what was happening during that call. It gives you right down to the code level of visibility. So you've got a, a call trace in there, and you can see exactly what code was executed. Um, it rolls in anything else that might be happening. So if you've got exit calls out to other services, stores, uh, it'll tie it to anything that's happening with your database too. You get um, custom diagnostic data. And I, I put this in here because it's one of the things that became surprisingly useful to us. Uh, within the controller, you can dynamically, you can go into your code and pull values out. You can look at states that the application's in. Um, you can add custom HTTP headers. There's custom diagnostic data you can collect in your transaction snapshots, and you can do it on the fly. So we've used this in, in, in many occasions. So sometimes you'll see something going on, and you're not quite sure what it was, and you know, previous to this, it, it might have mean you have to update log4j or make an application change and try and you know, roll it out so you can get more logging, which is never fun when something's going wrong. Um, and here we could actually instrument it on the fly through the controller, wait a few minutes, and, and you start to see what's happening, and, and you can learn on the fly. Um, with the machine agent and lots of plugins that are available too, so you can take all of this application performance and code level performance and layer right on top of you know, server, hardware, and health too. So you know, if you've got a response time, you can look right away. Was, was there a CPU spike? Um, and again, help you to diagnose quickly and, and tie it all together in, into one area. This is an example of uh, a business transaction. And as we get into transaction snapshots, um, you'll see there's you know, lots of useful data. Mostly, you're going to really look at your, your load and response time and errors. Um, here's a call chart that you automatically get. I actually included this because uh, this was a surprise for us. We were, we were changing our OAuth implementation and had to layer in a, a legacy part of the application. And you know, we're looking at response times of, of what was happening in this particular um, business transaction. And, and at first, really shocked to see all, all these circles and tiers there, because they're really just expected an auth server and a, and a store to check some credentials and a, and a token to go out. Um, and discovered that as we layered in our legacy application, there was a use case where it was contacting all these other tiers and performing what would have been you know, a lot of our old activities needed for, for an, a login. Um, in this case, it wasn't destructive, but totally unnecessary. It was just all the stuff happening that, that could have gone unnoticed um, and annoying for any user in that, that case because it, it took twice as long when all this extra stuff was happening. So we're able to clean that up really fast. And, and this is what drilling down into a snapshot, um, when, once we made those changes look like, and hey, we're, we're only talking to what we want to talk to, and it's real fast now, um, and it was good. <laughs> um, so that's, that's your business transactions and your snapshots. Uh, dashboards is once you've defined your business transactions, this is, is we didn't spend enough time here, I think, when we first deployed AppDynamics and we've learned over time. Like, dashboards are real important. I would have spent more time in the beginning um, with these. But again, being from LA, like you, you don't get on a freeway without out looking at this. This is, this is LA's dashboard. Um, <laughs> you know, we can, I can look at something like this and, and know instantly you know, where the problems are, where the traffic is, where I should go, where I shouldn't. Um, 
you know, and your dashboards and app dynamics are, are analogous right to that. So they're your at a glance diagnostic and, and status tool. Um, you can get really comprehensive monitoring of you know, all of your service tiers and individual servers and, and nodes within that. Um, it most importantly allows you to connect the dots between all your systems. So you know, it's great to be able to see what each, each service is doing, but sometimes you really want to tie a bunch of data together in one glance so you can see what's happening. Um, it's your tool, to, again, to be able to trend things over time so you can make sure you know, performance is working in between releases and, and over time. Um, and we found it really great, too, to surface data between teams. So once, once we started you know, creating some great dashboards, putting monitors up around the office, having them everywhere, you know, then teams weren't always working in their silo. They could see how their services were interacting with other things. Um, and even outside of tech, this has been great, too. Um, you know, we have a lot of product-facing dashboards now that are more user experience or oriented. We have you know, dashboards that, that track business performance and availability and, and things. So it's been great even outside of uh, engineering and ops. This is an example of, of a real simple dashboard. It just shows something like traffic over performance. And I'm trying to illustrate how, how these are good to, as a super quick diagnostic tool. So you can see in the performance area here, there's a bunch of spikes. These probably would have set off um, some health rules. So somebody, maybe me, would have gotten a pager duty alert. And as simple as me, just, just looking across the office at, at one of these that might be on a, a monitor or quickly opening up app dynamics, you know, I instantly know, hey, traffic stayed the same. Performance is off. Definitely something on the back end. So I can click over to another dashboard. You know, we've got our front-facing uh, web microservices, two of our important API layers, and a couple of our you know, really important service layers beyond that. And again, at, at a glance, without even having to dig deep into, into BTs or go anywhere, I can see you know, here's, here's the problem, and that spike goes all the way down to API layer, and oh, it's this nasty service layer below that. So I instantly know who to hand the issue off to or exactly where to look. All the teams have dashboards, something like this, where we can see calls and errors. Um, you know, and, and the, the bottom line is, is a bunch of business transactions that might be in that service tier. And again, without, without even drilling down yet, I can instantly see, oh, here's the problem, and there's obviously an error. So now I know to go to one of those business transactions, click the error tab, drill down into one, and I probably figured this out in a couple minutes. So having all the dashboards in place is, is really, you know, key to being able to put this together. So now, now that once we had these tools in place and once we started to, to build this, we actually had a really natural shift from, from being very reactionary to problems to, to just being able to be proactive. And one of the, the instant things we notice is, you know, if you've been in tech, I'm sure you've had to handle things off between teams and, and there's the blame game, right? You know, Application people are like, oh, it must be the database. The database is like, no, it must be storage. Storage is like, no, it must be the network. And then it comes back to you. Um, so this gives us, you know, data for the win, right? So if, if, like in that previous example, I was able to drill down to a tier, I can hand that off to a team with very specific information. It's, it wasn't kind of like, well, well, we think it's the database, and now you go dig through all your tools and figure out what's going on. It was not just lobbing it over the fence. Um, now anyone can hand that off to another team and, and half the work's done. They, they know right where to go already. So having all these tools in place, you know, alerting became easy. So you, we no longer were responding to a bunch of outages. Um, we had everything. We would see problems coming. So you know, we, were, we were finding things when there were issues. And, and we were fixing them before they become outages. So I've heard a few people up here said, it's fixing the yellow. Um, and it, it just came very naturally. It wasn't anything we really had to, had to, to work on once these tools were in place. Um, you know, the health rules and the dynamic baselines, you know, for us, were able to be really predictive. So again, we could, we could spot issues when they were small and address them before they became anything major. Um, having these things, too, in place and, and all the dashboards really allowed us to socialize the system and performance beyond just on-call people. You know, when monitoring was a pain to use and you had to go digging through a bunch of you know, various systems and, and screens, you only used it when there was a problem. Um, now that we had nice, concise dashboards that could be everywhere, everyone's more interested. Everyone's watching it all the time. Because it, it, it is kind of a, a 
self-service and it was an engineering driven effort. Um, it really empowered all of our teams you know, to dig in and increase their own visibility. You know, when, when monitoring was a handoff and it was a bunch of ops requests and someone else had to do it when they got around to it, um, we tended to let these things go. Now, now teams are excited to, to build this stuff for themselves and, and really figure out what's happening um, in their applications. And then again, with engineering, once, once you give them the power to drill down you know, into everything that's happening and how their tiers are interacting with other tiers and how their code is working, they kind of love to, to start figuring things out. Everyone will push out a service and be like, oh, you know, why is that 500 milliseconds? I really thought it'd be three. You know, and it's, they're, they're constantly looking at their own work now and, and wanting to optimize before we have to, you know, before that was an exercise to constantly go back and clean up. Um, you know, and now they're happening. So as this shift happens, so we went from having a bunch of outages and a bunch of stressful times to, you know, in, in this fixing of the uh, yellow mentality, we had all, that shouldn't happen, was a common thing. So you could you walk through the office and you know, we, have, we have monitors everywhere and this was often me, I'd walk by and be like, what's that? Why is there a spike? It shouldn't be there. <laughs> and these, these types of transient things are, are you could have again gone, gone unnoticed until they became big problems, but now it's surfaced everywhere and now we find it. Um, we've got a couple examples uh, of, of things that Either I don't think we would have found until they became major issues, or, or, or just may have lasted for a long time, or I don't know how we would have put it together um, prior to, to having App Dynamics in place. Very quickly after we rolled out the solution, we had, we had one of these spike problems where everyone was seeing it in their own little dashboards and on their service tiers. You know, and, and we went through the normal steps of you know, individual teams were trying to diagnose it and they couldn't find anything with them, or the database or any other common point of failure, we couldn't find anything, and then thought, well, once we were able to go into this, the metric browser, again, we can layer all these things together. You know, it was happening on services that, that have nothing to do with another. So we could start to layer stuff together. I was like, oh, you know, we could rule out all these things because you know, they're both spiking um, and they never talk to each other. <laughs> it's got to be something else. You know, we suspected the network, but they didn't have a lot of ways to, to really isolate what could be happening in the network. Um, we had the database project with also monitors NFS. And we, by chance, clicked on one of those graphs and put together that our, our, one of our storage arrays was spiking at the same time. And it turns out then someone looked into that and someone who, who was no longer with the company at the moment <laughs> had done a really awful configuration change and it caused every mount in the storage array to snapshot at the identical time and then attempt to shift it off to another data center. So it was hammering every spindle on this array hammering our switches, hammering the network, just, just these instantaneous like pauses for everything. And once we're able to isolate what it was, you know, and, and, and give that data to the right team, again, like a five minute fix, and it, it, it all went away. Um, this is another common scenario. This, this is one of our Node.js microservices. So you know, we might push something out, stare at a dashboard, and like, ooh, you know, why is that response time like, like all over the board? Um, you know, and then very quickly, you know, I can drill down into one of those business transactions, and this happened to be a case in, in Node. Um, it was a single line code change where we added a pattern match um, that was getting executed too much and, and bogging down the event loop. So again, a, a little bit after pushing it out, drilling down into a couple BTs, we're able to make a one or two you know, line code change and redeploy and, and go back to, to happy state. Um, we're also in the midst of a, a, kind of another spike story. Um, we were seeing a lot of random spikes for a while and uh, able to identify, you know, we're a big Baltimore shop uh, for a bit and we're, we're just now moving off that, but uh, we're having save contention across a couple of our, our large clusters and, and it really came to our attention through a lot of these, these graphs and drilling down and looking at just some, some things we, we couldn't be there. Um, and it's what got us on the path of, of starting to look at a whole new series of, of architecture. Um, as it turns out, a few weeks later, we realized that this, this was a problem that we couldn't scale beyond. It was just going to be uh, a resource issue with this, this particular technology. But had we not seen these spikes you know, weeks or a, or a month previous and began planning, we would have actually been at a catastrophic failure point. It was only because you know, we had been tracking this and you know, engineers were, were digging down constantly 
that that we began to evaluate other solutions, and you know, we're going to get it out by the you know, barely in time <laughs> before this thing goes. But you know, we would we would have been in a really bad state right now had we not had these tools in place to see these little issues, you know, building over time. Um, Okay, so we, all these tools were great. We had everything now covered in our infrastructure and the data center. We could see everything that was happening you know, for an API call or, or user visiting the site um, from a code point of view. So after that, we decided to extend this out into end user monitoring. Um, and this has been great for us uh, from one of my initial slides. It, we, we understood our application now, but we couldn't really tell how that was impacting our users or what that experience was. So end user monitoring takes everything that you've got in the data center and just takes that a step further. So you can see all of the same data, you get similar snapshots, you can see everything that's happening um, out on the web, so you get all your individual web pages and timings, every Ajax request, third party request that happens. Um, and your native mobile apps, it deploys right into the code, you automatically get all the network requests so you can see um, you know, the user's experience in native mobile, it layers in crash reporting on that. So you know, if, if a crash is related to something that might be happening in your infrastructure, you can quickly tie that together. Um, you can create custom events and timers. So if there's things that's an, important to your business um, that, that you want to be able to trend that the custom, customer's doing, um, you have some flexibility there to do that. You get the same snapshots on the client, so just like in the business transaction where you can see an actual call move through your infrastructure, you can actually see an actual user's session. Um, if we just use, I, I use this on Saturday. Uh, a VP called me, he was having an issue, like you doing something on the site, and I was able to you know, look up his user and, and see, see the error he was having as he was having it, and you know, assured that a fix would, would be done by Monday. <laughs> um, so it's, it's really great to get that same level of visibility all the way out to the, the end user. Um, one of the things for me as an engineering manager that that having this end-to-end, -end, moving it to the client and having the visibility on our application infrastructure side, um, the complete picture has been really great to be able to justify and prioritize our projects. You know, companies never like to pay down technical debt, right? You always want to be working on something that's going to be revenue generating or user facing or, or something like that. Um, so having this data to surface that you know, if I want an investment either in, in you know, time and resources or, or hardware, I have clear data to show why. And once we've done a project, once we've completed it, I have great success data to compare. Say, hey, you know, we put in this six months to do this, and here's how much better we are today. Um, also, it's, it, it's been a really great tool for us to be able to prioritize um, the right type of enhancements uh, between teams, so there, there might have been a situation before where, hey, maybe there's a user pain point and something's a little slow. It might touch you know, three service tiers or three teams involved. You know, they all go to the drawing board to try and you know, fix each of their applications, and everyone will come back to something like, hey, I took 300 milliseconds off that save, or hey, I saved 40 milliseconds off you know, my part of the call. You know, this goes on for a couple weeks. Everyone releases. You put it all together. It's still the same for the user. Like, you haven't saved anything. In a, in a tool like this where you can see everything down the chain, you can identify those bottlenecks quickly so you know, you know hey, I'll, I'll take time, time savings anywhere, but if I know the bottlenecks up here, I'm not gonna waste the time downstream until I fix this. Um, and this, this has been a, a great tool for us to be able to not only pinpoint and find those bottlenecks, so we're not you know, hunting and pecking until, until we get the performance issue resolved, but to be able to prioritize that work so it's done in the right order. Um, this is, also correlating the performance to business metrics, again, that's just another key in being able to justify things. So you know, now we know, you know for us on dating site, profiles are important, everyone likes to look at things, so I can tell if that slows down, you know, does it impact? Do, do less users you know, view profiles, you know, do less users buy? That type of thing, we can start to tie that together. And this last bullet point, again, kind of a surprise to us, we didn't think we'd use this, but we, we do quite a bit having the end user monitoring, and not only tracks everything into your data center, but you see all the calls that are being made to any third party you might deal with. So if you've got payment processors, or tracking pixels, or ad networks, or something else, or CDNs, um, you can see what's going on with them, too. So if you've got a vendor you know, that, that has SLAs, you, know, you can keep them honest, you can see what's going on. We've used it to compare various CDN vendors and make decisions on that. that. Um, and it's also a quick, 
quick thing. Sometimes you get slowdowns, and you, you can see very quickly, you know, is this something I can fix? Is this something we've got to address in our data center, or is it a third party that's, that's taking, taking the page of this, this app view? Um, take a long time. So again, all, all this just allowed us to connect the dots, um, changed our culture so teams could work better together, changed our culture so we, we, we weren't fixing broken things anymore. We were, we're constantly fine-tuning what we have and, and able to build and stand up new services um, with much more confidence because we know how they're interacting every day. So you know, we went from kind of the unhappy old driver to, to, to smooth sailing, and things have been good. <laughs> Anyone have any questions? Yes, yeah, so to see that the, the call graph, that builds out only to the servers or service tiers that you have instrumented with the, with the agents. So, um, you know, it can, like I said, it, everything starts front to back, so if you have all of your layers covered, it'll draw those correlations automatically. Anyone else? You're an easy crowd. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very little these days. Um, you know, before we had a unified APM solution, yeah, it was all over the place. <laughs> um, again, this, the, this came in part due to the cultural shift I was talking about. Once, once a few teams saw the success that other teams are having, everyone's asking for it now. So um, database was probably, they were probably the most nervous team, actually, to get that final layer covered. Um, but again, once we were able to, to to connect all the dots and, and show success you know, from the engineering group, the adoption's been pretty easy, and we're pretty well covered now. So. We do a SaaS controller. Um, I didn't have that in the initial slide. It was, it was actually something we were looking for up front. Again, I didn't, you know, due to time and resource constraints, I don't want to have to build anything and bother our ops team. So. The fact that I could keep it off-site, and then if we have any data center problems too, it's still accessible. So do you share SAS controller or is it I think we have a dedicated SAS controller. Yeah. No. Back. We just have one. So yeah, we've divided, with a single controller, we've divided it up into different applications so we can get different levels of visibility. Um, you only get a certain number of metrics per application too, so sometimes that, that can cause you to want to divide things. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more time? Um, not yet. They have actually, there is, there is a networking product in the works. Can I talk about that? <laughs> <laughs> that was demoed that, that can tie that together. Um, you know, if this has allowed us to very easily pinpoint if a network might be at fault, but then right now that is still a handoff to our networking team where they have to go to their various uh, consoles and, and hunt, hunt that down. Yeah. They, um, You know, honestly, I don't remember what, what it is. I think they're around for seven to 14 days currently. Yeah, we're, we're using whatever the standard is. Um, again, with, with the predictive nature of this, it's honestly something that hasn't been a concern. We don't have to go back in time very often anymore. You know, we see it coming pretty fast. Um, you can save, turns out, if there's, if there's data that you come across and it's interesting to you, you can choose to save it in this case. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, 
it's been a continual evolution. Um, I think the getting the dashboards right and starting to tie performance, performance of our systems engineering and IT to performance of the business, that's, that's where we're starting to take it now. And I think that's, that's sort of the last bridge we want to gap. Um, you know, when we first rolled it out, we didn't, we didn't spend a lot of time on the dashboards and, and got a little mired in too many BTs and drilling down a lot. And it becomes an, an exercise of lots and lots and lots of clicking. <laughs> it was really learning that spending some time and, and layering your services properly and, and, and dashboards that, you know, that mean something, they're going to be different for everyone. Um, how useful of a tool that, that became. For us, the, the thresholds went pretty easy. You have to give us some time to, to, to start to develop the, the right baselines, because like I said, ours, you can go by hour, by day, week, or month. You know, and, and because our, our traffic patterns vary widely through the week, we had to wait a little bit to get that going. Um, honestly, health rules are pretty easy because you can lump a bunch of business transactions or services together and apply, apply the same rule. And we just use standard deviations, basically. And in most cases, in terms of errors and response time, you know, I just want to know if I'm, I'm two or three standard deviations over or under. And you know, that gets both things. I can see when things are going bad and slowing down. Or if calls drop, it's usually an indication of a problem, too. Um, so it catches both the spikes and, and dropouts. We're, we're still in a bit of a process on that. Like I said, this was initially engineering driven, so our ops team held on to you know, some of their tools for longer periods of time. So as we were rolling out more of the machine agents and, and they're building some dashboards, we're beginning to, to turn down some of them. Um, you know, we, we've kind of gone a long way with, with Graphite and Collect D and some of our own real custom monitoring. Um, we've probably decommissioned three quarters of that now since, since we've had everything instrumented in AppDynamics. So you know, it's aging out <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, and, and other than some annoying systems that, that are just stuck in, within a certain team that no one has proprietary knowledge for, and we've been, we're, we're slowly you know, dialing down the rest of the email alerts or, or ignoring them. Um, you can depend on your organization. Like I said, I, I was really gutsy and I just did it. <laughs> so I can only I I speak, speak for us. Um, we've had very few issues. Um, like I said, I, I, I tend to just be ballsy and I just pushed it out and watched it on a server and if nothing looked like it was going wrong, we just we rolled it out. <laughs> um, and we've only had one, one issue in production, I think, since we've had this, and that was on the Node.js side. And you know, we were pushing right on the edge of the release cycle. Um, with the job agents and things, we can, we're a little bit more conservative. We're always a couple of releases back. Um, you know, it's, it's only really when I was trying to be you know, very cutting edge that, that I've had to be more careful. All right. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day.